My name is Paul Sohi. I'm an industrial designer for Autodesk. I like to build things, take on design challenges, and collaborate with designers, engineers, and fabricators from all over the world to build better things. They have some pretty great stories, and these are some of them. Welcome to Intersect, presented by Redshift. Welcome to Intersect. Today I'm joined by Guy, who previously worked at Boston Dynamics, Megabots, and is now at other labs in Breeze Automation. Guy, welcome to the show, man. Thank you, nice to be here. So you've had this really incredible career. You've worked at a bunch of different places. And what was the driving force to start uh, Breeze? And can you tell us more about what Breeze does? Towards the end of my career at Megabots, I said, look, these robots are just too expensive, right? Like nobody can afford to buy them. Other lab had a program already for the past six years developing pneumatic robots, right? Air powered robots, different kind of fluid, but basically the fundamentals are the same. The math is a lot harder. <laughs> That's Food dynamics suck. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> exactly. What other lab had was this technological base of really, really cheap components to make pneumatic robots possible, and they needed to keep developing the hardware, right? Mm. So the previous team had spun off into a company. They still had all the hardware, and I looked at it and I said, "Look, this is this is the opportunity I've been waiting for to really make the cheapest possible robots I can imagine." That's the mission. Is like take all of the advantages of fluid power systems that I've been working on for a decade, right? Ability to be outside, ability to withstand whatever environment you throw at it, ability to like generate really high forces for very little weight, right? Take all of that <laughs> and now make it cheap. What I love about it and what I find so fascinating, I just as you've been talking, is a lot of what you've discussed and a lot of the things that you've built wouldn't be possible without the technological advancements that have happened as you've grown up. So with that in mind, like what are the what are the things that are coming soon or technologies that are being developed currently that you've got you got your eye on that you're really excited about that you see applications for? I'm really excited about the possibilities of actually integrating machine learning and robotics. Mm. And I think that's been in the lab for a very, very long time. Um, and I think there were some pretty hilarious uh, missteps early on where you know, people say things like, I don't need any of this classical education on like how systems actually move in the real world. I'll learn it all from first principles. And then you have a machine sitting there learning from first principles for decades. And now people are finally saying like, oh, hey, maybe all of those classical controls that make robots work that have been worked out for like the past 80 years might be the launching point <laughs> to actually do the learning we want. Right. Right, and so now you're kind of finally seeing people like get grounded in the reality of how robots work and get grounded in the reality of what machine learning is capable of. Mm -hmm. You're starting to see them mix and you're starting to see some like really, really impressive results. You talked a little bit about the, um, the challenges and primarily from like a kind of financial perspective and how that yeah. limits what you do. But beyond that, like what are the other kind of challenges that you've been faced with Breeze? The robots that we're working on are inflatable they're pneumatic and hydraulic robots where the actuation isn't from like a hydraulic cylinder with a rod that comes out and pushes really hard on something else. Mm -hmm. It's actually from these like chambers of fabric, right? In the, in the interest of pursuing very cheap things, right? You like inflate a chamber of fabric and it moves your robot, mm -hmm. right? And that means two big things. One is that it turns out actually inflating in only the direction you want is really hard. <laughs> Like, when you inflate something, it wants to go everywhere. It wants right. to be a sphere, yeah. right? You don't, <laughs> spheres aren't that useful, right? So trying to harness inflation as an actuation source is like mm -hmm. really absurdly hard, both from a theoretical perspective and in the reality of like, oh my God, it's just a balloon. Why don't you do what I want, <laughs> right? <laughs> like, so that's one. Um, but the other part is that we've kind of, as a society, built this entire technological tool chain mm -hmm for basically things that look like milling machines in the 50s. Milling machines in the 50s wanted to remove thousands of an inch of material quickly and precisely, right? And so the kind of evolution of the gear motor of like a rotary encoder on the back of a motor with a gearbox in front driving a thing and attached very, very rigidly mm. to your system has been the modality for all industrial robots since those machines came out. Mm. So you have this system that's designed to be really, really rigid at all times, 
right? And then it turns out animals and humans are like orthogonal to that, yeah. right? <laughs> like we don't care about precision at all. We care about like gentle contact forces. We mm. care about balance. And if you take a machine who's, who's been designed entirely for precision mm. and you take it outside and you're like, pick me that apple off a tree that's swaying in the wind, like plus or minus a foot. <laughs> right and like do it now like what are you waiting for yeah right what you'll end up with is like if you're lucky a gripper that has speared the apple right <laughs> and like is coming back to you right right uh if most likely you've ripped the branch off the tree in the process of getting your your you know industrial arm all the way up there yeah and you certainly haven't been tracking the way the tree has been moving unless you have a very good sensor system that costs far more than the robot arm in the first place. So it turns out that when you have a system made for precision, it just doesn't do the things humans and animals do. If you're going to try and do the things that humans and animals do, if you're going to try and operate outside, if you're going to try and do like work in unstructured environments, you got to invent everything yourself. <laughs> because nobody up until recently, in the last 10, 15 years, has really cared about operating in unstructured environments, operating outside, the pristine factory floor mm. environment and then suddenly you go outside and you try and do anything mm. right and your sensors are blind your robot causes damage to itself and the world if it touches something that's really fascinating it, it's actually helped me a lot to understand the driving force behind soft robotics when i looked at it for the first time it felt like a tangential progression Right. And I didn't really understand what it's used for, but that makes sense. You touched on a lot of stuff there, and it feels like if we've thought of uh, the zeitgeist of, of uh, mechanical knowledge in the way that you've described it, which I would say is really accurate, to some level, like you can argue that the, the factory and the machines as we've described them is because those are really easy to understand and, and we want to put order on stuff. And so we've always thought of everything else as squishy and chaotic. And now we're advanced enough to understand that there's a lot of order and precision to these other things too. It's just messy and unbalanced in ways that are not familiar to us. I can give you a, a visceral demonstration for your, your sure. viewers. Yeah. Um, so let's say I'm a, a precision robot arm, mm -hmm. like an industrial robot arm. Tell me how I as a precision robot arm would approach picking up this cup. I've played with some industrial robots, so I would probably write some like really basic code and then run it through that step by step and keep adjusting it at every step until I got it right. But it would only work if that cup was in the exact same place every single time. If the cup wasn't in the same, it, like if it was just, hey, you got a table here, yeah. right? Like what would the system need to look like? to be able to pick that it's cup so up. It's so complex. It would have to be a person, basically. It needs, <laughs> it needs vision, it needs to have some sense of like feedback when it's grabbing things, and then you have to write a fair amount of complex code. Because So it's funny that you bring that up. I use this as an example sometimes to help people get their head around robotics. It's like when you move your arm, it's a completely autonomous process, and yeah. you don't even think about that. But now you have to translate all of that every last element of this into code to make an inanimate object do the same thing. Right. So what is the answer? <laughs> well, so, so if I were a precise ro or precision robot arm, I would have probably multiple layers of sensors mm -hmm. to figure out where the cup is. Just to like locate the cup relative to myself, mm -hmm. I'd have a system of encoders, it's pretty standard on an industrial arm, have some sort of contact sensing, and I would sit here and I would like come up with a trajectory so that nothing touched before I could grab, mm -hmm. right? And so I would very slowly approach, you know, in the way that my gripper was open, I grab, right? Mm. And if I have feedback, great, I can know when to stop grabbing. If I don't have feedback, then like maybe I know I've grabbed it when it shatters into a couple <laughs> pieces, right? And, and maybe more likely is, is that I don't grab it and then I do this, <laughs> right? And like all the humans in the room groan. Does that sound familiar? Like yes, a couple of robot I, demos I, you've seen? <laughs> I've tried to recently make a robot to flip pancakes and that was a nightmare. Um, <laughs> yeah. it was, we went through a lot of batter. So, you know, comparatively, if you have a soft robot whose job is to understand the forces that it imparts on the world and the, the world imparts back, mm -hmm. right? Like that's the basis and then precision is the next step. The problem is a lot easier problem you can solve the same way a human would solve this problem. If I were blind mm -hmm. and I knew there was a cup in front of me, I would probably do something where I, you know, like had my hand out and mm -hmm. I said, oh, I've touched it, right? I'm going to grab it. Right. 
uh, soft robot can do the same thing. Mm. It's called a haptic search, where I say, oh, first of all, I'm going to make contact with the table. All right, I know where the table is. Right, and now I'm going to keep my gripper open, and now I'm just going to go until I've made contact with that gripper, and now I know the cu cup is there, and I'm going to grasp, and I'm going to make sure I have enough force on the cup to have enough normal force so that it doesn't fall, hmm. and I'm going to grab it. The cup could be anywhere on the surface, mm -hmm. and that algorithm could work, right? Especially if you can say, oh, hey, whoops, I know I contacted there because I have force data from everything, and I didn't see it in my gripper. So I'm going to back up, and now I have a better idea. And, oh, there it is. When you change that kind of paradigm from, I have to know where the hell this is to grab it, mm -hmm. right, to, oh, I'm just going to bump around and I know I won't cause damage, everything changes about how you can interact with the world. With that in mind and what you're developing at Breeze, if you're looking back on this in like, maybe it's 10 years, maybe it's 20 years, whatever it is, what does the vision of success look like to you guys? What is the like, yeah, we did that? cheap robots out in the world doing really hard tasks that current robots can't do, right? So for example, there is no like small underwater robot arm right now. If you want robot arms underwater, you have a 5,000 pound minivan sized robot with its own boat, right? And that boat is $200,000 a day to go somewhere, drop the minivan in the water and use excavator arms to try and do something. Right. Wow. And we have operators who've told us, like, yeah, it takes us an hour to, like, see a rock on the seafloor and, like, get the arm over, pick it up, and then, like, put it in a box. An it hour. seems exhausting. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it's like playing the worst video game ever. <laughs> right. So, like, human-scale robot arms that can do work underwater just don't exist. Because mm. when you scale your vehicle down to the size of a vehicle that could easily be tossed overboard on a raft or something like that, right. the arms are small enough that they snap off if they're rigid. So like the oh, wow. underwater environment doesn't care right. how you know you want to behave. If you are rigid, you break, and that's just it. So Autodesk has been connected to uh, you for a while in different capacities, whether it was with Megabots or with the uh, with Breeze Automation, and now you're here at the San Francisco Tech Center. And yeah. what has that been like? Has how has this space like helped with? Uh, what you guys are doing, or has it, it hindered it? You know? No, it's, uh, it's been amazing to be here at the Technology Center. Um, you know, we estimate we've saved like forty to fifty thousand dollars in prototyping costs wow. um, because what we're doing is at the the bleeding edge of hardware, mm -hmm. right? Like building our own custom valving uh, and putting it into our own manifolds that, oh, hey, happen to be like structural parts of our own robots, mm -hmm. which requires super weirdo shapes and like, um, you know, mechanisms mm -hmm. to work. Um, and we can only prototype mass manufacturable processes, which is the ultimate goal, with real tooling. You can't make a mass manufacturable thing mm -hmm. Cheaply, <laughs> I guess, yeah. right? We're, you know, it's it's pretty hard to do it with like low cost processes. Mm. So being able to like use a real milling machine, use a real CNC lathe, use all of these printers that are printing at like, um, you know, strengths of their materials that are realistic to what you could get out of an injection molded process. I think that's what's really letting us do enough hardware iterations to nail down, you know, the stuff that has to, like already works in theory, and then when you reduce it to practice, also has to then work in practice, mm. right? And those, those steps, the more iterations that you get, the better your final product is. All right, Guy, this has been awesome. <laughs> Thanks for being on the show. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Thank you.